activist and writer from Social Laboratory in uh, Macedonia University of Thessaloniki. Discuss uh, national identity and myths of origin. Uh, what I think I could do as a contribution to this discussion is to focus on the Greek case, uh, the same as Richard did for the UK case. Uh, so, on the development of uh, a myth of Greek uh, nationhood for two obvious reasons. This is the one I know best, and also this is the one that came first in time in the Balkan Square, from which everything started. But when I'm talking of a start, I do not situate this start in classical Greece, of course, but in the 19th century. Uh, to be more precise, I refer to a construction of classical Greece, a specific notion of it used in the 19th century for the foundation of uh, this modern uh, nation state. Uh, it is interesting to note that the term myth itself was used uh, in a positive way uh, for this construction, and it was itself claimed in an effort of nation branding, as uh, we talked about this morning. For example, this is clear here, it's uh, a tourist uh, a campaign, Leave Your Myth of Greece. Uh, but, uh, as always happens, this use was open to uh, reappropriation uh, for reasons, for uh, purposes of parody or satire, and also for uh, purposes of political campaigning, which defy this uh, top up uh, definition of what Greece is and its myth. So, this inversion with your Greece and myth, and this uh, demonstrator. Uh, wearing a mask to protect himself from uh, tear gas. And another uh, instance of parody here. Uh, this construction, this mythical construction, emerged and became prominent once again during the name dispute, as it was manifested in or as an anxiety for an identity and civilization theft for which the Republic of Macedonia was accused. The polemics against the use of, of the name in Macedonia uh, was framed not only in terms of authenticity versus fakeness, but also and mainly of legal owner versus thief. Uh, to think of it, it's a very bizarre notion. Uh, it treats origin and civilization as if they were an asset, a material thing with a capital T. I think it would be very useful and appropriate to, use, uh, to pose the question where this treatment comes from. This reaction is not self-evident. It was contingent, as I was saying before. It was a choice among several other causes of action. And uh, in my presentation, I'm not going to discuss this in a, as an example for my main argument, which is what I term as the petrification of culture. It's a neologism uh, of culture or of history. Because the accusation that somebody wants to steal a name is a very bizarre one, and it's worthwhile to question, uh, question oneself where it comes from. In the beginning, I mean, uh, of the dispute uh, during the 90s, uh, in the discourse of Greek nationalism, the name was presented as a means to an end, 
a signifier that would function as a bridge for the scorpions, as they call them, for uh, the alleged thief to appropriate other assets as well, uh, possibly land, uh, who knows, or, and, or other geostrategic advantages. But with time, the name was autonomized. Uh, that's my impression. And now it is presented as a value in itself. Even more, we can find, uh, can find discourses where the problem is posed the other way around, precisely. Material advantages are imagined as a bridge for uh, malevolent foreigners to appropriate uh, the name, uh, to exchange uh, and buy out this name, which itself is more important. Uh, to make this clear, we can use an example. Uh, that's all great to you, of course, but this guy is a, a, a performer. Uh, uh, he's a politician, uh, actually. He used to be a prefect, Mr. Panagiotis Psomiadis, uh, a prefect of the Saroniki. Now he's uh, destitute because he was found guilty of corruption in three consecutive degrees. He appealed, he was again condemned, uh, appealed again. I mean, uh, he is now off his position. But he still insists, this is uh, much later than his destitution, and he uh, made, uh, made the declaration concerning the alleged offer by Mr. George Soros to uh, cover the expenses for heating uh, elementary schools in the, in the town of Nausa in uh, northern Greece. And according to one account, uh, this, the offer was refused. Uh, according to another account, not really, it was not really refused. Uh, in the first place, uh, the mayor said, no, we'll never accept this kind of offer. But uh, on second thoughts, they accepted it. It's not very clear. Uh, so Mian takes as granted that uh, it was refused. And he issued a congratulatory uh, statement, which is extremely melodramatic. And this is uh, an English translation now, done by me, uh, addressed to the president of the uh, So, Greece is still there, uh, national dignity is there, <laughs> it resists. Uh, and, uh, Could you read it? Uh, yeah. Uh, dear Mr. President, with this letter, I'd like to congratulate you on your decision to refuse the offer nation that the well-known business manager of Soros want to make, wants to make to the schools in Nausa. With your proud, brave attitude, you demonstrated that there is still hope and that the national dignity of Greece is still there, it resists, and does not tolerate any charity from the supporters of Scopian propaganda. <laughs> it is to note that no mention of uh, the Republic of Macedonia was made in, in this offer. <laughs> but so now this is certain that uh, there was a hidden intention behind it. This is, uh, it continues, it's uh, quite long, it's only a part of the letter. The resounding no to sneak donations should be an example for the authorities of our country who are under the pretext of the economic crisis and of the relief of, for students suffering in frozen classrooms open the back door. Uh, here he uses a very loaded term in Greek, uh, which is Kerkoporta, and it is supposedly the door uh, in the walls of uh, Istanbul, or Constantinople, which uh, was opened by some collaborator of Mohammed the Conqueror, and so the Turks entered, otherwise they couldn't have uh, conquered uh, Constantinople. So uh, whoever accepts a donation by source, he is paralleled with a traitor of the nation. And of course, the nation was not, Istanbul was not uh, part of Greece, but <laughs> we do a series of, you know, uh, leaves and everything. Would you be kind to give that uh, the name one more time? The name the of word, oh, the word in Greek. The word is Kerko Porta. Porta is the door, the Italian, and it is a name, a name yeah, of yeah, Kerko Porta. It is very used in in the discourse of Greek nationalism. It's very often, if you want to accuse somebody of a traitor, you say you open the Kerko Porta for the enemy to enter. The, the, the here the they call them Sorosoids. Do you know that here the traitors are also so called Sorosoids and they are oh, really? sponsored yeah. by Soros and they work in favor of Greece? No. <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that. Maybe it's the Jewish uh, dimension. <laughs> <laughs> you find everything so uh, international capitalist Jews is yeah. Yeah. even forced. Uh, 
and he continues uh, like traitors, this kind of traitors, unfortunately always existed throughout Greek history. He mentioned other names as well, I've uh, omitted that. Uh, so let Mr. Soros keep the charities for the schools in Skopje. We'll never give up our weakness. Uh, <laughs> what is interesting in this discourse as well is that there is a sexualization of uh, like surrendering, uh, open the, opening the door, penetration. I mean, he uses this kind of imaginary. And this is clearer in another statement the same person did uh, the same month. Uh, he replied to some comments done against him by uh, an MP from Syriza, the uh, radical left party. And uh, Somialis uh, responded to that, saying, I seriously start to believe that Comrade Tatsopoulos, that's the name of the guy, and Syriza are in love with me. <laughs> no other way is left to me anymore to explain their frequent references to my person. I will displease them, but they are not of my liking. Uh, about three years ago, this guy, same guy, uh, had done, when he was exactly during his trial, he had done declaration uh, which translates as, I do not wear string pants, uh, <laughs> meaning I'm not a faggot, you know, I'm not a gay, I'm a real man. But he declared that on TV. Uh, and the journalist asked him, what do you mean? Somebody else is, or I don't know, but I'm not, I'm a real man. I do not wear string pants, I, I wear uh, trousers. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning, like, the Greek word, like, when you say pusli, which is actually, I guess, an Albanian word, I'm not sure, means you are uh, dishonest, you are cheating, you are uh, acting in two, in, in two ways. So that's what he was wanting to, to denote. But the, the court thought otherwise. Uh, so these are instances uh, that where the name uh, is sexualized and also treated as a value which is superior than money. Uh, Soros wants to offer us money to get the name, but we are resisting. We, do, we are the proud uh, virgin, you know, who uh -huh. uh, is this strong male person coming to buy us. Uh, but we are uh, virtuous, so we refuse <coughs> these indecent proposals. Uh, not, but apart from the name, uh, also uh, words uh, and language at large itself are being fetishized increasingly in the discourse of Greek nationalism. And all over the Greek-speaking uh, cyberspace, there is a large wave of irrationalism. Uh, I don't know if this thing be existed before. Maybe internet gave it uh, the opportunity to manifest itself. But you can find thousands of uh, posts over the internet uh, uh, fetishizing on the Greek language. This is one example. This is a book. It was issued uh, as a book by Mrs. Anne Stefanidis, who uh, is a doctor, but not of linguistics, of some other discipline, I forget which one, saying in English, you speak Greek, you just don't know it. And this, this is a list of supposedly, uh, or in, uh, English words, supposedly of Greek origin. Well, most of them are, not all of them. <laughs> there is some, uh, like, for example, paradise is a Persian word. Anyway, uh, we have this long list in, in English saying more than 6,000 Greek words that are used in English. And the number is there in a cloud, like a yellow cloud, to be uh, underlined. Uh, this is a more scientific uh, way of presenting things. This is part of the, uh, the preface to this book. Uh, a wonderful journey into the magic, I, I underline uh, my emphasis here. There's no emphasis, but uh, all. The magic of an exceptional language, the Greek language. It's an exception, the magic. These are very symptomatic, these terms. The magic and the exception. <laughs> Greek is an exceptional language, not like any other language. It is one of the richest, most accurately structured and logical languages of all time. Uh, every word has a meaning, uh, as opposed to other words. <laughs> <laughs> no meaning. It's serious, don't laugh. It was very insistent. 
<laughs> and have a reason for its existence. There is a direct connection between the world and the me. <laughs> <laughs> So, but you already could speak Greek, you just don't know it, it's the, the obvious uh, emphasis. And here we see more clearly the obsession with numbers. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, one out of four words in the English language is Greek, all of Greek origin. When it comes to medical terminology, it's more than 50%. <laughs> this is in Greek, but actually the same thing. And uh, uh, you see the numbers like 490,000 words of the English language are Greek. Uh, oh, sorry, this is the total, uh, the total of the words of the English language, out of which 41,615 words, not 16, 15, they counted one for one, and they are made of three words. Uh, this is attributed to the Guinness Book. And uh, this is uh, the second uh, statement attributed to Bill Gates. And uh, supposedly saying that the Greek language has a mathematical structure which is uh, apt for <laughs> mathematics, for, uh, and as one can imagine, because <laughs> Bill Gates. Uh, <laughs> anyway. And uh, what is also interesting is that he insists as well that there is uh, a necessary link between the signifier and the signifier as opposed to other languages where there isn't one. <laughs> and here, you can, I left it in Greek so that you can see the, the Latin, the, the English word in there. This phrase means, in a common language, an ordinary language, such as English, we can agree, everybody can agree and say, a uh, car for cloud, cine for, uh, say car for cloud, and cloud for car. Uh, as soon as we agree about that, it will be valid. But in Greek, it, that's impossible. <laughs> because there is a necessary relationship <laughs> between the sum and the, the mean. <laughs> and it, it is a complete absurdity. I mean, it, but what it is important, what is interesting, is that this discourse invokes a scientificity. Uh, they need, they, they, it is almost a parody of a scientific discourse because it uses quotations and like data, statistics. Uh, this is the, the truth, you know, uh, uh, scientists have said that. Or the science, in Greek, you use definite articles, so they use always e epistemi, the science, which is anthropomorphic, it, it's, it's uh, feminine in, in Greek, uh, nouns are gendered, so. It is e epistemi ipe, has said, the, the science has said, uh, not uh, defining any specific science like oceanology or you know, linguistics, any specific discipline, but science in general, has said that English is an ordinary language, whereas Greek is exceptional. It's, uh, it has a mathematical structure. Uh, this, and also the obsession with numbers. Uh, I'll omit here, but, sorry, there was one other slide showing uh, a mystical reference to numbers, which they like Pythagoras in the antiquity uh, um, created this theory according to this uh, post, according to which each uh, letter of the alphabet has corresponds to a number, and if you add the numbers, you get some philosophical ideas. It's a complete absurdity. But people write this and read this and believe. It. I mean, it's not not linguists. Uh, linguistics is probably the only field where the scientific community in Greece is, is in total uh, disagreement. I mean, li Greek linguists, much more than historians and philologists, insist that this is absurd, that it has nothing to do, but they don't believe it. They say, you are paid by Soros, you are enemies of the, of the nation. <laughs> how, how can you say that? You, you should say that uh, Greek uh, language is uh, the most important. And now, here I have a quotation by Karl Marx. Uh, I parallel this, uh, this notion that our institutions, our language is natural. Whereas other, this is an excerpt from the poverty philosophy, uh, where he marks so that theologians say that we are the, the true religion, but no, the 
primitives have uh, their gods, but these are not, not real gods. They are artificial. Our god is the real god. It's uh, something very similar. Here we'll make a break and see a short video. The Greek language is a mathematical masterpiece. <laughs> it's a masterpiece. Uh, you have this aesthetization of uh, life. Uh, the French director Jean-Luc Godard, uh, probably ignoring this uh, frenzy uh, and going on in Greece, he said, of course, in good intentions, when the, the crisis broke up, uh, he, he said, we should pay Greece 10 euros for every therefore. Why? Because uh, Aristotle was the founder of philosophy, so he invented syllogism. So we used something that belonged to Greeks. So every time we use a syllogism, we should pay 10 euros and any other Greek word. Of course, this is not, uh, it's not certain that it will be, uh, financially speaking, positive for the Greek uh, economy. Because uh, if, when Greeks say, every time they say, Buzuki, Moussaka, you know, Piatto, Porter, maybe they should pay the Turks, the Arabs, the Persians, so maybe the balance will not be very positive in the end. <laughs> but we see this notion of uh, the, the, the world as an exchange for financial advantages, and which is more important? Uh, it is something that uh, here is a post uh, on, on the Facebook, uh, Stella McCartney, the, the, uh, Paul McCartney's daughter, uh, made the post, British Museum rules, obsessed with this, uh, uh, no, Stella. And immediately, before anybody commenting, any friend of uh, Stella McCartney, <laughs> asking out, stolen from the Parthenon, <laughs> another guy, these models belong to Hellas in capital letters. Get them back to Greece, you British faggots. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what I'm trying to make uh, uh, is a parallel. I mean, this notion of petrification. You have this notion of theft. The, the British stole our stones. It belongs, uh, they belong to us. Get them back. The Macedonians want to steal the name. And my uh, construction is uh, along with this, uh, well, the, the author's name does not appear here, but there is this guy, Yanis Kamilakis, who is an archaeologist at Southampton University. And he has written these very interesting books, The, uh, the Nation and Its Ruins. And uh, I think that the marbles, the stones, were used as a model, I, and language was built on this model. Uh, in order to cover a very deep anxiety. Uh, here comes a more theoretical part. Uh, Herzl, who was mentioned this morning as well, has created this notion of crypto-colonialism, speaking precisely of uh, Greece and Italy and Thailand. He's an anthropologist and he's done 
fieldwork in these countries. And uh, my construction is that uh, from its inception, the Greek nation uh, adopted a notion of Hellenicity, of Greekness, which was uh, fabricated in Western Europe. And it was essential for European colonialism and racism because uh, the Greeks invented the most perfect uh, civilization that has ever uh, existed. And we, the Europeans, are uh, the, the heirs. The, we inherited this uh, civilization. That's why we are superior to the barbarians. And we are entitled to uh, rule them and because they are barbarians and we are civilized. Uh, this had already uh, happened, it was formed in the 19th century. When in the early 19th century, some people came and said, we are the Greeks. Uh, probably because, I mean, in the, uh, what is called the Greek Revolution, and in, in English the term is the War of Independence against the Ottoman Empire in 1821. Uh, there, the people who, the, the grassroots fighters, were an assemblage of uh, people of several ethnic origins, speaking several languages or dialects. And uh, we are not really sure what they, uh, they would define themselves, how they would define themselves we were, if we were able to ask them. But there were some elites like merchants and intellectuals who saw that the term Hellenes, Greek, well, in Greek it's different, right? Well, there was a lot of discussion, which name should we choose for a new nation? And uh, so they chose, after many discussions, the name Hellenes in Greek, uh, Greeks because they realized that uh, Greek, uh, Greekness, Greek civilization, had a large appeal to Western Europeans whose assistance was crucial for their uh, uh, endeavor, for uh, gaining independence from the Ottoman Empire, which they did. But this was the easy part. As soon as this was uh, established, uh, they had, uh, this was a shield for them, but it was also a, a terrible burden which creates a permanent anxiety because they think we are like a continuation of the most perfect civilization that ever existed. Okay, but what is this inheritance, this heritage? What does it consist in? Uh, there's no possible answer because, well, if we go out in the street in Athens or in Thessaloniki and ask why is the Greek, uh, ancient Greek civilization important? Uh, because it's important, because it has marbles. We have the Parthenon and you, you see there are buildings. Okay, uh, they build these buildings, fine. But, okay, there are other buildings uh, elsewhere. But we have the most perfect language. This fetishization of uh, language, of words, of names, is an answer to this threat, to this menace, because uh, it is, a civilization is an abstract notion and it is immaterial. And if we ask a hundred people uh, why, what was the importance of this civilization, uh, maybe ten will say Aristotle uh, founded philosophy. Okay, what did he say? If we ask them, what, what was the theory of Aristotle? Do you use Aristotle today to think, to do something? No, but he was important. And this creates an inferiority because we are the heirs of important people, but are we important? We are just Balkan peasants. I mean, when in the uh, war for independence, many people, including Lord Byron and other people, came to Greece to fight against the, bar the Asian uh, barbarous you know, invader. And there was a large deception. They were disillusioned because they were expecting to fight Miltiades and Leonidas and Pericles and everything. And they found Balkan peasants speaking Albanian sometimes, or maybe speaking Greek, but a very different Greek than they uh, knew. And it was like uh, Lacan said when the Jouissance comes, the enjoyment comes, the subject said, that's not it, ce n'est pas ça. And this is the difference, that's not it, is the very cry by which the jouissance obtained is distinguished from the jouissance expected. So, uh, Byron came to Greece expecting the jouissance and he, he was disappointed. So this installed a permanent doubt uh, and a permanent ambivalence, which was a double ambivalence, because 
the European Orthodox, the arguing, the Greeks arguing, the, the, the heirs of uh, Miltiades and Pericles, but this was also internalized. And the subject keeps uh, asking itself, am I really, am I important? And uh, this uh, abs uh, absurd discourse that we have 6,000, uh, 41,000 uh, words, whatever, is a way to petrify something and put a material thing. Now, you see, we influence, so it, we penetrated. We, this also is sexualized. We penetrated into the English language, which is the, mo the most important. The, uh, it's a lingua franca, but it is ours in, in reality. Uh, a large part of this is ours, as if a culture was a material thing, an, an asset in itself. And. Uh, this is why, in Greece, it's easier today to find people who are critical against the uh, Greek nation. Actually, it is a form of nationalism as well, because uh, after 10 minutes, every Greek will tell you the Greek state has failed, uh, politicians are corrupt, uh, we, are not, we do not uh, behave properly, we throw cigarettes on the street, uh, Greeks uh, will never, uh, they're not really civilized. But you will not, you'll not find one person who will be critical to this hierarchy of, of cultures. Uh, from the inception, the Greek nation adopted this theory that European uh, civilization is the, the top, and everybody else is not yet there, as these guys in Deepesh Chakra about this uh, very beautiful uh, book, Provincializing Europe. Nobody in Greece thinks of provincializing Europe. They are convinced that Europe is the capital, and we have to be part of this. We're not yet there, as I said this morning, but we'll arrive there. We'll, we have to make every effort possible. But nobody thinks that to say that this is just one contingent civilization among others, and there's no hierarchy of uh, cultures. So uh, I maintain that to, to sum up, to close, that this adoption of the notion of we are the continuation of ancient Greek civilization is like precisely, to use a Greek word, one of these six times, <laughs> as Delta says, pharmacon uh, uh, in ancient Greek, also in modern as well, is both uh, the drug, the medicament, the, uh, what you take to get cured, but also it's poison. Uh, so the same uh, Act was the salvation and also the condemnation, the curse for the modern Greek nation. And uh, the petrification of models and of uh, words, of, of names, is a way to uh, face, to respond to this uh, unbearable anxiety created by, the, by this adoption. That was more or less so. I tried to take note of some, basically. Uh, what I could find uh, from both uh, presentations of thesis is that uh, once the um, thesis that was initiated by Richard regarding the purposeness of nationalism and how the nationalist uh, uh, policies come into being, uh, relating to what you said that uh, at the beginning they look like they are only purely at this uh, imaginary symbolic level, but then they acquire a sort of value uh, which later can be economized in different, in different uh, uh, ways and also uh, regarding the more or less with the uh, interplay of different processes in, in neoliberalism and uh, in the crisis in Greece uh, your ending uh, quotes were I think quite interesting to compare with the processes of capital which concentrate to time of crisis and austerity in the centralized, in the, in the centers of capital like Germany is in the European Union. So the crisis which is felt in peripheries like Greece would uh, make people develop uh, their civilizational shame but in the bedrock we still have some processes of capital which then are manifested, manifested in different ways. I don't know, would you like to start or do you have some no, not really. Uh, it is right what you said. There are points of convergence, and uh, I have no real remark. Let's uh, address the whole thing, unless you have a question. Yes, the floor is now open to, um, to questions, and through which maybe you can relate also to the
Katerina. Actually, I noticed the point of divergence. Uh, diver uh, divergence? How do you call it? Divergence. Uh, <laughs> it's a Divergencia. Uh, between uh, uh, the two talks, uh, two uh, uh, points you made, uh, which were uh, more or less central, I guess, the, the core of your thesis, of each of the two presented thesis. Uh, I don't know if I understood uh, Richard well, but his point was nationalism is something which is used by capitalism in order to make money, let's simplify. Whereas uh, Akis says that in Greece uh, the, uh, the ruling discourse is uh, uh, name, so, uh, which means culture, right? Uh, or cultural heritage, history, etc., is more important to, uh, than money. So, is it uh, okay? This is not divergence, but, but uh, just uh, uh, I don't know different statements. And uh, I'm wondering which one is true, actually. I mean, both are fetishes. Money is a fetish. And uh, you know, national pride, uh, pride is fetish. I mean, is there really any difference between them? And if there is, what governs uh, the fetish of nation, of uh, values, or whatever, uh, any form of totem of this sort? Is this uh, what controls money and capital, etc., et or the other way around? Okay, question to both of you. Um, so, I, I should clarify what I mean then. Um, I definitely don't think nationalism is used by capitalism to make money, um, because I don't think uh, that one can speak of the interests of capital as such. Um, I think you have to... Um, okay, so it's a hegemonic project. A hegemonic project in this part involved a fraction of capital or a number of fractions of capital that are actually um, uh, probably not representative of the majority of business made its breakthrough. That's why it needed a popular ballast. Um, so it wasn't just uh, about making money, although obviously accumulation is a huge part of it. Um, there is a, a relative autonomy in terms of, you know, the importance that they assign to ideology and to uh, forms of uh, discipline and government and so on. Um, so, um, I, I'm, I'm, I don't claim to know the situation in Greece at all, um, but um, my sense is that this wouldn't necessarily be incompatible with the idea of a ruling discourse in which um, you know, we value uh, this culture more than money for one reason or another, um, because um, the immediate uh, instrumental purpose of culture is not always the most important thing from the point of view of um, conserving um, uh, social formation and getting accumulation going. That said, though, um, there is something to be said for the idea that um, certainly as neoliberalism unrolls, wherever it does, um, that the assets um, of the, the, the things that constitute being a nation um, are increasingly seen as uh, just little bits of capital. They're opportunities for generating an income stream. Um, and um, this is, um, I mean, this is this accounts for the kitschy element of a lot of um, sort of official nationalism now. I think there's an element of that downtown. Um, and um, uh, certainly in, in the UK. And I'm just, I don't know, but I'm wondering if that's, uh, you know, this uh, idea, you know, that we've got to tell people, Greece, uh, Greek culture is, is in your language, you know, it's in the way you go about your day-to-day -day business. Um, uh, is there just an element of um, uh, simply deploying it as a, as a, as an, as a, in an entrepreneurial way? Definitely, yeah. Uh, it, it is part of, or not exactly what I was going to say, but this ambivalence, uh, the question you pose, uh, is an ambivalence that is inherent. I mean, there is no solution to it. And uh, at times, it is difficult to tell what is the pretext and what is the, uh, the hidden purpose, the not the uh, implicit purpose. Well, as I said, Godard did this, uh, I mean, said we should pay the Greeks because we owe them. And here we have this notion of the debt, we owe something to somebody. But uh, in, before a crisis, uh, this is a very 
complex issue within uh, the Greek public sphere. For example, uh, in some years ago, the uh, some minister, never mind what kind of minister, he said that tourism is the heavy industry of Greece. Uh, this is itself ambivalent. That, that Greece has no real heavy industry. You're not making cars or you know uh, computers or anything as other people do. But at least we have culture. You can read it both ways. Uh, I'm doing a research book in Greek, but let me uh, mention another example. Uh, during the Civil War, uh, because this is another uh, dimension of you know, the, uh, the background of the uh, Greek nation state, in the 40s, as you probably know, there was a very bloody civil war which produced more uh, casualties than the actual war uh, against the Germans and Italians. And during this uh, war, uh, a guy was executed. Well, there is Belojanis, which is a rather famous case, who was executed in 1949, along with Belojanis. There was another guy, uh, Dimitris Batsis, who was executed as well, who was a famous lawyer. He was not uh, a warrior, a proletarian. He joined the Communist Party. And in while in jail, because he stayed in jail three years, I don't know, he wrote a book, uh, maybe before Edward J. He wrote a book uh, entitled uh, How We Will Be Able to Develop Heavy Industry in Greece. And this was supposed to be uh, a blueprint, do you say that? It's, it's a, a, a draft for uh, when we obtain power, when the communists win this uh, war. And this is, will be our program. And he was, it was very detailed, a large book saying we'll have to exploit uh, metals and, you know, uh, uh, whatever, and build big factories for people to find work. And, and this person was executed. And uh, after the crisis uh, broke out, the book was reprinted. Everybody has forgotten this book for half a century. And it was reprinted and uh, did very well in, uh, in terms of sales. So there is this pride uh, about uh, having tourism and why do we have tourism? Because, of course, because of beaches, but also because of the But shit, it's not a real industry. It's, uh, it's not a real thing. And in the current discourse of the uh, Communist Party, which, well, it has the same name, but it's not really the same party, but uh, in also in other discourse within Greek society, uh, this tourism being our main industry is uh, experienced as humiliating and you can find in Rizos Pastis, the organ of the Communist Party, 10 years ago, uh, it was very common to find expressions such as uh, we don't want to be the waiters of Europe because uh, it's also ex extremely masculinist because being a waiter is like uh, being a, a girl, uh, receiving orders, it's passive. We want to be active and have, like, you know, masculine. We have to have the real thing, build factories and cars and heavy industry. So you have both. And uh, the one is used as a pretext for the other and also maybe other things, but it is an ambivalence inherent to this organization of, of Jewish songs. <laughs> I'd like to ask you that if you have uh, an agenda on uh, uh, neoliberalism, the relation with uh, nationalism for the former East, uh, because I think that uh, an, uh, a difference of, of neoliberalism, nationalism in the former East and the West should be made. Because I see this uh, uh, in a way the post Soviet, uh, post socialist. Uh, proliferation of nascent states as kind of uh, ticket uh, to the, uh, so to say, uh, global equity market where, uh, of the, the, the uh, uh, concurrence and, and so on in the early 90s. Uh, and uh, the pro proliferation of this and the ideological background uh, of, uh, and the new, new uh, movements of uh, nationalism uh, in a way, I see this as they were based on the roots of uh, socialism, communism. They were somehow hijacking the way of thinking 
of societies from non-Western and non-capitalist societies. So uh, if, if you have uh, some thoughts about if such difference should be made and how it could be compared in the world. Um, very quickly, um, yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, there's a difference. That, I mean, I don't totally agree with the point why I said at the beginning of the talk that this is not the same thing as the kinds of nationalism that emerged in those states where social property relations were being really transformed in a serious way, new national bourgeoisies emerging and therefore nationalist projects being bound up with uh, really serious uh, re reorganizations of class power. Um, the only way in which I really disagree with you, um, I guess it's that, um, it, it's in, I mean, this comes back to the next question of so what does really existing socialism actually mean? Um, and if, um, I mean, if you are, if, if you're convinced that these, the, the societies that were, um, that were uh, overthrown in uh, 1989 and all that uh, were socialist societies, I can understand you can see nationalism as building on certain resistant capacities then. I mean, really I think they were, um, I, I will defend this thesis, I think they were forms of state capitalism. I think they were forms of, in which the state acted as the, a, 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 effectively a capitalist enterprise um, dominated um, in a global sort of law value. And therefore, um, nationalism works quite well in that context. Um, and so to see it as, as being, um, I can see how in some ways it would uh, exploit uh, the certain uh, ways of thinking, certain ways of existing that would be uh, be, that could also be used by socialism, um, but um, I, I think we have a slightly different perspective on how that uh, works out in the East. It's rather according to uh, Richard Seymour's uh, analysis, it was uh, fascinating for uh, for me to see over how he was describing the model of current, how it works currently with neoliberalism and the governments and nationalism, because it exactly describes the um, dominant discourse uh, in Greece right now, not regarding nationalism, but regarding the reforms. So it is something that yes, has I, to do with yeah, it. Yeah, because it's exactly the factor example that the, the state, had, the, that the nation altogether had has to find, again, as we say, its entrepreneurial culture. The, the famous Balkan merchant used to be modeled by, on, on that, and that we have lost this and we have to find it. And even they say that, you know, people who lose their jobs uh, can find the opportunity to, to get into business, to be dynamic, and they disregard totally the social effects. The government passes more and more authoritarian in a, a laws in, the, in an authoritarian way by ministerial degrees instead of the parliament. And uh, also the, 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 uh, the re-establishment of law and order, the, the, the anti-immigration campaigns, uh, the sovereignty issues about also about defense. It's, it's very typical. We, when you are in a certain country, you think that this is something that happens only in yours. But actually, if we notice, this is happening all over you, the European Union. And, uh, and I want to say also about what, what I was saying, that all, all this discourse that is particularly, uh, you know, a little bit uh, uh, hysterical, is more, is more um, prominent in times of crisis. It was more prominent in the early 90s, uh, to, you know, this uh, tr trying to redefine our culture, our nation, uh, the language, or whatever. It, it regressed when the economy was doing well and everybody was happy with, uh, you know, with uh, money earned in the, in the books, um, you know, in 1990, 2004, the Olympics and everything, and then it re-emerged with the crisis. And what else re-emerged, of course, is the extreme right and what we are facing now. And there is a continuity between this <coughs> popular, banal, nationalist discourses and of course the people that are ready to put that in action and to be violent against others.
Yeah, that's that's very uh, well, very correct, and also the lazy civil servants yeah, and uh, this kind of yeah, yeah. it's uh, their fault. And if, when I uh, I would I would like to say the same thing when you're describing this uh, that's right uh, axioms, it is exactly exactly the same discourse. Uh, be active, and it's your fault that you're receiving too many uh, unemployment yeah. benefits and this kind of thing. And, and also, of course, you have this redeployment of. Uh, Golden Dawn, which is I mean, linking to uh, things that were uh, said this morning, and also in my presentation, uh, you have this Hollywood image. I mean, uh, the antiquity they are referring to is mediated from Hollywood, like this is Sparta and this kind of thing. If you see the uh, Golden Dawn uh, rituals, uh, they try to invoke like uh, ancient uh, authors and stuff, which they don't understand anyway because. Uh, a different language, but their image is very much mediated by uh, like the narratives of, of Hollywood, or the, like the Persians, the war, Alexander, whatever. And uh, it is uh, who who was first, and like it's the question of the, the egg and the uh, the chicken. But uh, it's capitalization of the mythology and the mythologization of uh, the capital. It's uh, it's going together. Uh, also, I want to this extremely valid niche, but that as a tendency happens for moment that is adding grief. It is your fault, it is your fault. When you look at the European level, I mean, uh, axiomatically, if you look at what happened to Greece as a result of these uneven financial transactions and deals, um, and on the other hand, you have this growing discourse, and not only in, in, the, in the centers of capital, even in Macedonia, we hear very often. Uh, uh, that it is Greeks' fault by themselves, they are very lazy, they just wanted to have debts, high salaries, drink coffee all day long and now they cannot pay the debts. Even though we are aware of the statistics of Eurostat, that the Greeks work per week, quite some, I, mean, I think up to seven hours more than most of the EU countries, even more than the, even more than the, even more than the, uh, the Germans. But this kind of uh, um, imperial uh, uh, colonizing, uh, argument is used now I mean, to, to gain political support in Germany in order to push for like uh, unbearable austerity measures to be accepted by Greece. So basically, this interplay of capital and, and cultural civilizational values, um, which are as they are now set up in Europe, in, in, in the axiomatic relations in Europe, they do play also a role in these political decisions regarding the redistribution of capital <coughs> across the continent. Greece, Greece is. Um, <coughs> Greece is a bad entrepreneur, you know? Greece made bad investments. You know, somebody should have told them, they should have got better advice. This is, you know, it's exactly the same discourse that they aimed against individuals. And the whole point, of course, of uh, neoliberalism is that the only kind of actor, really, uh, doing anything is an entrepreneur. Whether it's an individual, whether it's a family, or whether it's a national state. And so uh, it makes perfect sense. And of course, Greece uh, ruling classes happily and busily internalizing this image you know we've been too lazy you know we've allowed um, ourselves to laze around and drink coffee and so on i just the, the only thing i want to add i mean when this stuff was being done in britain i want to ask you if this is the same um i mean the the way this was done it did tap into resonant popular ideas popular ideas of one uh, the freeborn englishman you know uh, the gender nature of that description by the way is not accidental um, the freeborn Englishman, uh, meaning that um, uh, you know when you look into the origins of this discourse, it's highly colonial, it's highly gendered. Of course, it just basically means uh, white men are, are free to you know in, in their own homes and so on, and uh, the state should leave them alone. Um, and it's to do with property rights and so on. But that's a resonant idea in British culture, because it's also linked to all sorts of other things: the English Revolution, um, ultimately uh, the tradition of civil liberties and so on. Um, and secondly, the idea of discipline, um, and this is to do with, um, you know, the idea that basically that, that everybody should be working for a living, and if you're not working, why aren't you working? You know, um, you must be some sort of a parasite, you must be a loser, you must be lazy. I mean, even before neoliberal ideology comes and takes hold of that and organizes it and, and reinforces it in a particular way, it's there as a residual um, and not, to, not completely active element, but it's definitely there. Um, and I just wonder if in Greece um, these kinds of projects are actually, are, are they doing that? 
Would you like to respond? Yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, it's a very good question, but it takes a, a lot of time to apply. In principle, yes, but uh, the particular implementation of this idea cannot be done through the freeborn Greek uh, world. If you do the historical jump to like Pericles or ancient Athens, uh, which some people do, but you cannot uh, hide that, for example, you, don't speak, you cannot speak about the freeborn Greek in the Greek Macedonia, because everybody knows that two generations ago, uh, most of the people were in Asia Minor, they were not born there. <laughs> they, I mean, there are particular uh, historical uh, conditions which does not permit one to say that, but from uh, the 90s on, uh, where uh, before that, we had this discourse, uh, uh, an ethnicization of political dispute. Because if anybody is trying to make a left criticism, they're told to go to Bulgaria. If you don't like, this is Greece here. If you don't like it, go to the Soviet Union. This is Greece and this is how we have it. Then. When Albanian, real Albanians, and then real Pakistanis and Somalis and uh, people from other nations, uh, Afghans, uh, started coming, uh, the uh, ultra-right discourse uh, used this, uh, this uh, precedent, saying uh, you have to behave yourself and don't ask for your rights and everything. If you don't like it, go back to Afghanistan and uh, this is Greece and we're Greeks and it's about us and you shouldn't ask for rights for you. So they used precedents and public, uh, publicly established discourses and imaginaries, which are not exactly the same as in English, uh, Actually, born English, Englishman, but it was the corresponding uh, imaginaries and other examples, which I omit because it's a very long story. Hi, uh, I just have one comment because most of my questions were answered in the last uh, uh, 10 minutes, and that is that when uh, Katarina said that uh, there is a divergence, there is a noticeable convergence on uh, there is an agreement on the discourses that are operational in the, the nationalist discourses that are operational around the world uh, taking the uh, greek example and taking the british example uh, the discourses that are operational in everyday life if we even look at Mas in macedonia those same discourses how to uh, make people aware of the discourses of nationalism that are operational on that level. And that's not a visible level until uh, academics don't analyze it. So this is just a comment. 